So hello again for those joining through the recording. Um, the agenda for today, we're going to start with an introduction to disability arts and culture, uh, talk a bit about Tangled Art Gallery and some of our accessible art practices. And this is a presentation I'm hoping that won't last too long because I want to hold some space for questions and answers. So on the screen here, I've got some black and white interpretations of what are called accessibility icons. And these have been made by Valentin Brown. So from the left to the right, we've got a graphic picture of an ear, a nose and a mouth, and then a heart, and then a hand. Um, and I'd like to start off with this slide because many of the access practices that are becoming more common today you know, have really been advocated for in the disability community or originally emerged from, you know, these grassroots organizing efforts. Um, these access practices were really motivated to allow disability to shape culture rather than using access as a way to simply kind of slide disabled folks into normative practices. And so when we're telling the story of disability rights, justice, and accessibility, I think disability culture can't be untangled from it. And disability arts, you know, disability, deaf and mad arts is inherently political um, because it's about engaging the lived experience of disability and accessibility is sort of one of those ways that we remain vigilant about how our work is being engaged with uh, because of this, it inherently recognizes access can't be treated as this sort of one size solution to so-called fix the problem of disability. And given that we all are experiencing culture differently right now, perhaps more accessibly during the pandemic, um, I think we need to pause at this height to just sort of reflect on what accessibility centers, largely because so many practices that had previously been denied to disabled people are now being provided only under the hand of kind of this capitalist necessity. Um, and this is where disability arts comes into play for its ability to counter that single story narrative of disability and helps us imagine stories of a different flavor. And that's why I really like this image of these icons that have been created because it really helps us to bridge the ways that access and art um, come to form disability culture. The next slide I've got here has a quote from Mia Mingus that reads, we don't simply want to join the ranks of the privileged. We wanna dismantle those ranks and the systems that maintain them. And so, I want to just say that there, there is no single definition that captures disability arts, but it is sort of generally agreed that disability arts is a specific arts practice that involves disabled artists, mad deaf disabled artists, creating work that expresses their identity as disabled folks. And disability arts carries this additional dimension of meaning in that as disabled practice arts practitioners move their work forward individually and collectively, they're contributing to the expression of a distinct disability culture with unique experiences and perspectives and shared values. And so significantly, you know, I use disability arts here as sort of an umbrella term because as our name Tangled suggests, you know, the expansiveness of our community and the diversity of our art forms means that there is no single narrative of disability arts, but rather it's a collection of movements that all work to advance towards disability justice. And it's here that I also kind of want to include just a brief story about my own journey as a disabled artist um, and how it kind of led me here uh, to Tangle, because Tangled is, I think, really unique as an arts organization. We're staffed entirely by those with lived experiences of disability. And we found by far, you know, 
the most effective approach for us to creating a culture of access is through centering the community we serve. And, you know, to approach this idea of access from the perspective of cultural producers rather than as passive audience members and receivers of access. And so I think that's sort of the spirit of disability arts that I wanted to bring into this space so that we can consider, um, as we're considering, you know, the questions and the submissions that uh, we're so excited to receive from everyone. I'm gonna go through a few different images of um, our space and talk a little bit about a couple past shows just really quickly. So I've got an image here of our current gallery space. It's suite 124. And on the left, I've got a picture of our vitrines. Those are uh, window vitrines that are programmed separately from our gallery. Uh, and so those can display um, works of art um, as sort of a way for folks passing by the gallery to experience. And then on the right, we've got the actual uh, inside the main gallery space, which is around a 1,000 square foot uh, kind of uh, nondescript rectangle. <laughs> I've got a layout over here of what our entire space uh, is like. And so the entrance, which starts at the top, um, you come in, there's what's called an acoustic gallery on the left. And so that's a space that's been padded with uh, soundproof panels, uh, which we sometimes program with uh, different installations or sound works. Uh, and there's also a bit of a foyer that you come in before moving on to the main gallery. And we can do a bit of a tour with Heidi Prasad, our gallery manager, who can uh, answer que more questions about the space. I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of the exhibitions that have happened in Suite 124, which is a relatively new gallery space for us. Previous to that, we were located right next door at Suite 122, which was a smaller space. So we've essentially had three shows in our current space, one which is currently happening and I don't have photos for, but um, the two that have previously happened was called Sagate, S-A-G-A-T-A-Y. Um, this was a show in partnership with CSV and it was curated by Janie Castrillon uh, with two other uh, indigenous artists, Kate Miyawasage and Danielle Hyde. And then the show that we had just before this current one um, was called Hashtag Crip Ritual. Uh, this was a show that was on two sites, the Tangled Art Gallery and the Doris McCarthy uh, Gallery. And it was curated by the Critical Design Lab and it had a lot of artists, so I'm not gonna say everyone's name. <laughs> uh, these are a few images from the um, Sagate exhibition. So there are two works on the sort of uh, cardboard sort of brown um, uh, backing and they depict the different seasons. Um, these are works by Danielle Hyde. On the floor on the bottom left is an arrangement of stones by Janie Castrillon. And in the center is a dream catcher made by Kate. This is uh, another uh, shot of a work in the gallery called I Forgive the Ones Who Wrong Me. Uh, this is also a piece by Kate. It uh, involves a bead kind of installation shaped to look like um, fire coming out of a copper pot. And it has an image of Kate doing a performance, um, specifically a jingle dance um, in the back. And then this is just another shot of that same performance on the right. And then on the left um, is a tobacco tie that Kate created as, as kind of a, an accessible uh, component, a tactile moment, but also a, um, one that um, Kate sort of um, talks about 
using this tobacco tie as a way to help decolonize uh, the space a bit in, in her own way, uh, using this tobacco tie as, as a way to spiritually tie back to um, her own um, her own identity as an Anishinaabe artist and taking those tobacco ties and putting them into that copper pot, um, which she then brought to ceremony and took those intentions in the copper pot, in, in the tobacco ties um, to, to a ceremony. This is um, an, a shot of the Crip Ritual exhibition. Um, there's a number of installations here. On the left, there are kind of a row of drawings on paper and then a little um, installation that's highlighted in kind of a pink glow with lots of photos hanging in the back. And it has like a, a, a partition made with curtains. Um, it's also been uh, divided, this, the back of the room has been divided in half using a portable wall. And so on the left is that installation, on the right is another installation with a tabletop of toy cars and a projection. Uh, to the right of that is a series of six photographs and then in the center is a white plinth with um, a knitted work. So those were some examples of the shows that we've had. And now I wanna talk a bit about some accessible practices in galleries and museums to consider when you're creating your, um, your proposal. So um, I'm just gonna read what it says on the slide, accessibility practice. It's important that we do not treat accessibility as a fixed solution. Rather, we can put into practice an iterative approach building on past learnings and collaborative efforts with our communities. We want access to gesture towards a crip horizon, an ever shifting juncture where disability culture and access meet as a cultural aesthetic, resisting the idea that access is a fixed point. And so essentially that means that we're always building off our accessibility practices here. Um, we don't really look just to a checklist to which we can kind of perfectly comply and never look at, but rather we work with our artists and want to um, think of access as an aesthetic. Uh, I have a question. Is it okay to take screenshots of slides? Yes, please go ahead. Um, if you wanted to take a screenshot of that last one, I'm just going to take like five seconds here <laughs> if you'd like to take a screenshot of this one. Uh, and this is recorded, so you can, you can also see the slide again um, later on the recording. So a couple examples of just some of the practices we've developed. So we hang our artworks at a lower level. Um, usually a typical gallery hangs at what's called uh, like a, a standard eye level of 62 inches. Um, and we think that's really high, particularly for folks like myself who are of shorter stature or folks who are wheelchair users. And so we use a 46 inch kind of midpoint. Um, and there's just a photo of um, the show Bina Bifida front to back. Uh, done by Steve Keen, which we exhibited at the Humber Lakeshore Gallery. It's a photo of someone who's a wheelchair user uh, looking at a series of photos of portraits of folks with spina bifida. And oh, actually my thing was covering the other, in there's also a second person uh, standing next to um, the first uh, wheelchair user that person is kind of standing and looking at the portraits. And so you can kind of see how the, the height is a more comfortable level for both of those folks here. Uh, another component to consider is tactility or touch. Um, this is, uh, again, this is by Valentin uh, Brown, who uh, created this soft sculpture kind of work 
um, this soft sculpture was touchable. It had different things that you could squeeze. It had different textures. And there were also uh, different kinds of like squeaky toys, for instance, embedded. So if you touched it or held it in the right place, it would actually react and make a noise. Uh, something that we've been piloting recently are Zoom-led tours, um, where if uh, folks can't physically come into our gallery, we'll do a uh, Zoom-led kind of tour of our show, uh, where you're kind of paired with a staff member, and we can essentially uh, give you a, a remote version of what it would be like to tour our space. And there's a photo here of our digital coordinator, Jet, uh, kind of looking at an iPad that's been set up with a script off to the right uh, so that they can kind of talk about some of the works that they are looking at. Uh, and then, you know, also conceptually, we've done a lot of different um, works that task us to think of access as a collaborative element. Um, here we have the possibilities of care as a sculpture on a white wall with an ASL statement underneath, uh, just sort of elaborating on what this piece is. But essentially, this was a work by Aslan Thomas, um, where Aslan created a tent free policy in our space um, so that anyone coming in was sort of participating in what they called an invisible sculpture, where um, we were co-creating this invisible sculpture around um, scent-free policies um, by kind of coming into the space and being scent-free and enacting that. So it was kind of a very meta way of understanding our scent-free policy. Um, one last work, and then we'll get to the questions. Um, I've got on the left a photo of myself standing in front of six uh, words that say undeliverable. And essentially, these are uh, some of our more relaxed um, installation uh, guidelines. Like a lot of spaces are all about making sure all the works are ready for the first day. And we really think that might not always be possible, and we don't want to penalize folks for that. And so in this case, the exhibition um, artist statements uh, weren't ready because uh, this was our first show af after we reopened, uh, after the pandemic, um, sort of like the lockdown. And so as we slowly reopened, um, we were able to mount this, this show, but we didn't have all the artist statements. And so we, we sort of rolled with it and we thought, you know, this was a way of understanding uh, um, value and worth beyond our productivity. Uh, I thought it was um, kind of a fun way to show what was not there yet uh, in this show called Undeliverable. And then on the right, there's an example of um, a deaf community member who is listening to a sound piece, but using a vibrating belt that we have in the gallery um, and uh, they're listening to the the works through the vibration um, i should i should put listening in air quotes but uh, they're experiencing the piece in uh, through the vibration of this this belt uh, so i think that's it for my presentation thank you for sticking with me um, I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen and I'm going to join our gallery manager in the gallery itself and we'll take some questions now. Okay, I'm just going to bounce over to there. And uh, Jet, if you don't mind spotlighting um, that other uh, screen, we'll, we'll hop over there. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm joined here by Heidi Prasad. 
Now, Heidi, do you want to start with a quick introduction of yourself and English description? Yeah, um, hello. I'm Heidi Prasad. I am a, I'm the gallery manager for Tango Bird uh, Plus Disability. I am a um, Guyanese brown skin uh, femme presenting woman. <laughs> I have a uh, long um, brown hair. I'm currently wearing a black mask, so you can't really see that much of my face. And I'm wearing a black dress. And in the background, we have um, work by Michelle Dumont. <laughs> they are grand circular orbs that are lit um, and are hanging from our ceiling. Um, and it, they are quite colorful with like gray and um, pink and green triangles uh, that are around and surrounding the piece. <laughs> Oh, um, so um, let's see. Was everyone able to hear that just now? Just got a note. Our volume wasn't really on. We're good. Okay, we're good. <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, start answering some questions. Um. Francis, I think you might, you've been collecting some of them. I think we have one. If you uh, don't mind maybe sharing that uh, either in the chat or just saying them out loud. Um, yeah, let's see what you say. I have really any document here. I can just kind of like. Sure. Just it. Oh yeah. Okay. Sounds so good. We have so far. Great. So the first question that we got was, um, is this opportunity open to international applicants um, or are you focusing on folks who are working with disability and have a direct connection to the local land. Um, yes, this is open to anyone participating. Um, I should note that typically we have funding available um, basically to cover um, an exhibition fee that goes to the artist. So your payment for, for showing in our space. Um, we have we, we can cover the accessibility for this show as well as the installation elements um, and beyond that we'll usually work together to think of funding so you know if, if you're if you need to travel and you need accommodations to come here uh, then we can we can work together to kind of um, figure that out but that is why we plan a year in advance so this call is for our 2023 and 24 season so we have some time to work together to think through some of those, those elements. The next question um, I got was, what kind of exhibition duration are you looking for our proposals? Um, and are artists responsible for installation and deinstall or does the gallery staff do that? So um, the exhibitions typically last somewhere between two to three months and we usually work with the artist to determine that and within our own kind of schedule of um, how many shows we're able to do. Uh, and, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, I can answer the second part of the question. So the gallery would generally hire an installer to um, install the exhibition alongside of the artist um, with like information with the layout that you, and to honor the artist's um, ideas and, and, and their um, exhibition. Um, and then as for the strike of the show, we would have an installer again, striking the exhibition and, and we would package the work and ship it out or um, kind of figure out a drop off and pick up date. Thanks, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next question, are we given a budget? So we do have a small materials budget, but it's, um, it's usually just uh, maybe like, to three hundred dollars, um, it's it's not a large. It, we're not necessarily commissioning new artworks uh, in the proposal. However, that's not to say that you can't uh, apply with a new idea. Uh, we can work with you to look at funding. We can look at look together to see if there are ways that we can make this happen. So I don't want to say to anyone, don't dream big. Dream big in your proposals. Um, and we can work together to figure out some of these, these elements and some of these funding, um, uh, different kinds of funding needs, basically. Uh, there's a question, is it required that artists attend in person? Nope, not at all. 
uh, only if you want to attend in person, will we maybe try to figure that out. Um, and then someone asked, does our art need to be about disability? Um, no, it does not. Um, I think, as I was mentioning in that definition about disability arts, um, it can be, I think, essentially disability arts is just about if you have the lived experience and the different stories that we tell about our lived experiences. It doesn't have to be about disability itself, but I think all disability art is informed in some ways by the aesthetics of disability and the way that we live our lives and navigate things every day. It might, for instance, with Michelle Dumont's work, be about uh, you know Michelle as an Ojibwe, uh, a two-spirit Ojibwe disabled artist. Uh, Michelle talks about how he uses packing tape as his medium because he has a lot of different chemical sensitivities. And packing tape ended up being one of the few materials he could use um, effectively and affordably. And so I think even though this work isn't necessarily about disability, it takes on some of those lived experiences. It kind of demonstrates some of those ways that Michelle has uh, innovatively thought through the material that he uses in his practice. Um, and then another question about that 46 inch midpoint. Um, does that mean it'd be better for art to be under 46 inches? Not at all. Um, but the 46 inch midpoint is a suggestion, particularly if it's something that needs to be read or come up close. Um, if it's a large work, for instance, we've had huge pieces that wouldn't possibly be able to be a 46 inch midpoint. We just want to make sure that folks are able to experience this work um, in a way that really uh, considers different audience members and invites them in. So if it's a big piece and it has to be higher, you know, make sure there's some clearance so that folks can see it from further back. Uh, that helps to create a more kind of equitable experience of seeing the work. The other question we have, do we have plinths? We do have plinths. I can answer that one. <laughs> we have three plinths. They're on a lower, um, uh, they're a bit on the lower side. Um, I believe they're about uh, 36. Uh, 30 inches high yeah 30 inches about 30 we, inches high we will measure it and we will put yes we, what we'll do is we'll um take some of these questions mm -hmm. and make a bit of a q a that follows underneath our um call for submission with exact information i believe our plinths measure 30 inches yeah and, right. and we also have two large uh tables or um almost like a like floor plinths uh um, that can be used in the space. Mm -hmm. And you would generally paint, um, paint them and just uh, fix them to your liking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can actually show you an example of what uh, that floor plinth looks like, if you'll join me as we wheels. come into uh, another space. Just a bit of a content warning. Yep. There is some nudity in this room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, maybe oh, I'm I'll just let this down, switch my camera. And so in this space here, this is our audio room, which has an installation. Uh, there's a floor plinth here where an artist, Logan McDonald, has created sort of an assemblage of works uh, that sit on this floor plinth. It's relatively wide. I want to say it's about five feet by four feet, uh, but we will find some exact measurements for that. And we will be able to share that with you. Okay. On the topic of equipment, I should maybe just mention, we do have six 40 inch television screens um, along with media players for those. Um, we're gonna kind of go towards it. Um, hope nobody has uh, motion sickness. Sorry about that. And one of the things that we always do is we take our public-facing text, particularly our exhibition statement, and we translate that to ASL. 
And uh, so usually one of those six TV monitors is used for that. And so there's essentially five other TV monitors um, that can be used alongside, um, we have two projectors and um, uh, yeah, two projectors, yeah. one short throw, and um, I, we're looking into getting another one. Um, and uh, we do have a bunch of ceiling mounts as well. Mm -hmm. So as you can see on this end here, um, yeah, we can throw the, the actual projector, uh, the projection onto the wall. We also, um, one thing to make note of is we have floating wall as well that can partition the gallery space and um, into your liking. Great. So the next question, are artists with limited professional experience welcome to participate? Yes, um, you are welcome to apply no matter what your experience, uh, no matter uh, whether you consider yourself a professional quote unquote artist or not, uh, you're welcome to apply. Um, how do we do a verbal application? So there's a few ways to do a verbal application. Um, either you can let us know that you'd like to do like more of an interview, uh, in which case we can bring a staff member on to help uh, essentially do the uh, application together with you. Or if you'd like to record a video or a sound like MP3 uh, recording of yourself, you can submit those two as options as well. Um, and, you know, don't be shy in reaching out if there are other ways that you can think of uh, in submitting, you know, a verbal application. You're also welcome to submit an ASL application to us instead. Um, and then the next question I got, do we only submit a proposal or final artwork? Um, either is totally fine. Um, in the proposal, if you want to talk about the final artwork, that's great. Um, the proposal should really cover some of the conceptual ideas behind the, the, um, the proposed exhibition. Uh, so, you know, if in the images that you include, you want to have those, um, those final artworks, then that would be really great. Uh, if you only have sketchups or mockups of what you're considering, uh, that's okay as well. Uh, if, if it's an installation, for instance, you can sketch what you imagine the space to be, what you would need to make it happen. For instance, I mentioned one artist wanted to create a room, and so we thought with them, you know, how do we create a petition? We'll need curtains, we'll need a smaller space. Uh, they asked, can we do kind of pink gels on our lights? And we said, sure. So we figured out, uh, you know, where to get some pink gels and they helped us um, source some of these things. Um, and we made that installation happen. Um, the next question I have, what is the height from floor to ceiling in the main gallery? 14 feet, but I wanna say, at around 10 feet is where the lights uh, and a lot of other stuff start happening. Uh, somebody would like to unmute to ask a question. Uh, Mamina, if you wanna go ahead and unmute, we are ready for you to go. Go ahead and ask. Hi, yeah, um, so it's actually pronounced Mamina, but it's not that Mom serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I just had two questions. So um, the one question is I don't have any kind of like formal training in like disability related things. Um, I have for a few years identified and it has evolved the different ways in which like I'm disabled, but I, I, unfortunately my life has not allowed me to like learn those things. So um, would it still be okay to apply? And then like, I would obviously feel comfortable taking any trainings that would make um, the, you know, the, 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 the show more accessible. And I, I would really like want that actually, because then I would get to learn, but um, I don't have that already. And then the second question was um, just about like, is there like a number of pieces or like any, any kind of structural requirements around that? Like how many pieces? Thank you. Great questions. So for the first one, uh, nope, you don't need any sort of training in, in disability arts or critical disability to apply. You know, we take all, all different uh, ways of understanding one's own disability 
and um, it's not necessary at all. A lot of times, you know, this is the role that we have in curating these stories is to think through um, what, what to get through some of that uh, <laughs> academic language and really find out what it is that we're, we're actually telling in these stories. And, and for the second question, um, uh, there's really no limit to how many works can come in, but you know, think through the, the physical space. We wanna make sure that it's still accessible. Um, so if there's lots of sculptures on the floor, like, and it creates a hazard for folks who are wheelchair users to come in, you know, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Um, and, and also just, you know, sometimes I think less is more. So think through, like, like be intentional about the work that is in the space. Um, but there's no, like, there's no, like, you can't have more than five works. Like, that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've had art, artists who were like, I want a hundred paintings in this space. And we said, all right, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Or, or like 30 to 50 illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in the case of a group show, this is a great question. In the case of a group show, does every artist have to be disabled? That one's sort of tricky. Um, that one's really done on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think it, it depends on what the, the sort of concept behind the show is, why, why um, a non-disabled person is being included. But all, all that to say, usually we are not, we're not the type of space to be like, no, you can't do this at all. So I think it would really be about coming to us with that conceptual idea around, you know, what is this group show? Why is a non-disabled person being, um, being brought in? Is it a disability-led project? Um, those are all important factors that we wanna make when thinking about proposals. The next question, if we have a proposed work that could work as a vitrine installation or in the main space, do you prefer the proposal get specific about the space we're proposing to install, or is it okay to leave this open-ended? Um, it would be great to actually mention that you'd be open to both spaces. The vitrine is usually, um, is usually done in partnership with other disability arts organizations. So for instance, Workman Arts um, has a, a, an upcoming vitrine show with us, Workman Arts being um, a mental health arts organization uh, okay. Being Studio in Ottawa, Being, B-E-I-N-G, uh, is uh, a studio that serves artists who have been labeled with intellectual disabilities. So we do a lot of group shows in that space with um, organizations, but we do leave it open for a couple of vitrine shows from solo artists as well. Um, the next question, if the budget or payment is based on artist fees and not material costs, does this not essentially end up excluding anyone on ODSP? Is there room to negotiate with Tangled to find a way to be paid slash selected for this while being on ODSP? Yes, definitely. So ODSP, we navigated with a lot of different artists and we've worked to find ways to pay folks either as honorariums, as installations, um, and essentially to try to navigate this in a way that serves them. We just don't want artists to essentially take their entire artist fee and put it into the show and not be paid themselves. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of uh, what we have slated for is a small materials budget um, and the artist fee. We are also what's called an exhibition assistance um, recommender organization. So a recommender organization is able to recommend artists for uh, a, a small grant called Exhibition Assistance, which covers things like the installation and the like, like extra installation costs or framing costs or like um, things that essentially help to make this exhibition happen. So, you know, that's one place that artists are encouraged to apply to if they have a show in our space is to apply for exhibition assistance as well. But we will work with you to navigate ODSP and make sure that you are paid properly. Uh, the next question, does the work need to be newly produced slash is there a date cut off for when it was made? No, um, you are welcome to produce 
new works or have a show either with works that are complete that haven't been shown yet, or it might be a show that has uh, shown in a different space. One thing that we do encourage is to consider access. So if this is a show that hasn't been um, shown with any access considerations or components, then that might be a new dimension that you wanna include um, in your proposal is the idea that you know you are amplifying this this show that's been shown once but with access components um do we need sketches of the proposed works or can we use works past to reflect what we hope to continue to do yes you do not need sketches of proposed works um that's just something that you can do if um, it would serve the application uh, is there a specific theme? No, there's not really a specific theme um, for our next, uh, no, there's not for our next call. <laughs> You're welcome to apply with whatever thematic is in your own work. And, and sometimes, you know, after we go through all the submissions, maybe a theme emerges from some of the strongest applicants, but I think we don't, we don't, we don't say anybody needs to serve a theme for this, this upcoming call. Uh, Next question, does the proposal have to be a group proposal or can you be a solo artist? Yes, you can be a solo artist or this can be a group proposal. Um, yeah. And then uh, another question, clarifying about the disability group, while this person is a disabled artist is doing bulk of the art, they'll be adding others to their project. Um, and they mentioned, you know, specifically, this is about trans art. Um, and yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, you, you can, the project can evolve as well. If you're sort of coming as the main artist for now, but more artists will be added to the group, that's totally fine. Um, it might be something to consider. Um, the next question in regards to grants, this would be uh, applicable to concept to realization grants from the Canada Council? Yes. Uh, so if, for instance, you are applying to us for a show and you then wanted to, once the show has been confirmed, uh, apply for a Canada Council concept to realization grant, we would help write a letter of support uh, and we, could, we would encourage you to apply to that. Yes. Um, Another question, you said there's not really a limited, a limit on the number of pieces, but would you say there's a minimum number of pieces? No, uh, no minimum amount of pieces either. Uh, and so we are getting to two o'clock. So I just wanna give a heads up to folks that I can maybe answer two more questions, which we've received already. And uh, then I'll have to cut it off. But if you do have additional questions, we encourage folks to send us an email yes. um, or to ask uh, to email submissions at tangledarts.org or info at tangledarts.org. So the second question, um, somebody asked, could we include writings as an art piece? Um, like something we wrote that's part of what we want to show. Yeah, totally. Uh, writing can definitely be part of the show. Um, you might want to consider how it's presented. Um, so, you know, if it's a poem, do you want it just digitally shared, printed on the wall? Um, you know, think through that component, but yes, writing is totally allowed. The next question, can the work be political in theme? Definitely, yes. we would love for the work to be political in theme. <laughs> Uh, and you know what? One last question. This is the last one. Where do we send the application? Submissions at tangledarts.org. <laughs> and Jet, our digital coordinator, just put that in the chat. Thank you so much, Jet. So it's two o'clock. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure getting to meet everyone. Thank you for the very thoughtful uh, really insightful questions. Um, we're going to take some of these questions and create a bit of an FAQ, frequently asked questions kind of thing and put it on our submissions page. Um, thank you to Cindy for interpreting. You are amazing as always. And thank you to Marina for uh, captioning. And thank you to all the Tangled staff. Uh, Francis, for instance, has been 
frantically oh taking down all the questions and showing it to me <laughs> in the back. So that's what you're missing. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone. And um, uh, again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Thank you. And uh, happy writing slash making of the application. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Happy application time. <laughs>